Thank you and, and good morning. We are certainly living um, in exciting times and um, this new um, decade has started uh, with um, calls for action to reduce uh, shipping um, carbon footprint. And it will be a, a decade of transition um, and it will be, it's difficult to, to know what or anticipate all the changes, but we can be sure that um, the alternative fuels, which is the topic of, of this conference, is going to uh, play a big role um, in this transition. So this year um, started with the new global um, sulfur limit for marine fuels and the switch over from heavy uh, fuel oil to low sulfur fuel has been anticipated with, um, with um, anxiety about uh, fuel availability, compatibility, quality and price. And the report so far um, range from um, news that everything has uh, transitioned smoothly to um, a lack of uh, also news uh, about a lack of um, bunkering parties as well as a uh, news about uh, contractual disputes um, because of the various complications in the transition. And of course, ship owners who have installed uh, scrubbers have taken advantage of the, of the big price gap between the low and high sulfur fuels. As you know, only a few owners so far have opted for LNG as a fuel um, to meet this requirement. But I'm, I'm sure everybody will watch very carefully in the, how, how this um, transition will play out in, in the 2020. So um, although um, the IMO global sofa limit is uh, quite significant uh, change to the industry, it, uh, its significance really fades in comparison to the IMO targets for greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and the targets that are set for 2030 and 2050. Um, there's a fairly common agreement that these targets, uh, particularly the 2050 target, cannot be met unless there are um, alternative fuels available and that these fuels need to be available by 2030 to, to make it to 2050. So um, there is no obvious um, choice of the, of the alternative fuel that would satisfy all the requirements and would have global availability, um, also in terms of the technology and the infra infrastructure. LNG is considered a, a transition fuel, um, but not um, as an ultimate solution. There are a number of pilots testing our various alternatives and a number of initiatives um, bringing the various stakeholders together. But it's still quite difficult to see um, how the industry can respond to the challenges that the industry has today and at the same time prepare for the next decade. The um, societal pressure for action by the industry and as well as the governments um, is increasing and the um, international shipping can, is not immune to this pressure. Um, for shipping, this could be both a, an opportunity and a challenge. An opportunity because it is an international industry and it also has an in international regulatory framework provided by the IMO and its member states. How, the in how industry will respond to this challenge uh, will shape its future. Shipping can either be a proactive um, with their self-regulation and become a sustainable, um, efficient um, form of transportation supporting world economy. Or it can become an industry that will be forced to comply with requirements set by regulators outside of the maritime framework. The industry has uh, demonstrated proactive approach uh, with a number of initiatives to work towards low and, and zero carbon solutions. For example, um, getting to zero coalition is a coalition 
of companies within maritime, energy infrastructure, and finance um, sectors. And it is commit committed to have commercially viable uh, zero emission vessels um, operating in the deep sea trades and supported by the infrastructure um, and production facilities needed to, to provide these alternatives globally. Another um, industry-led uh, initiative is uh, Poseidon Principles, um, which provides a framework for integrating climate considerations into lending decisions. Signatories uh, to the Poseidon Principles will measure the carbon intensity of their uh, lending portfolios on an annual basis and assess their climate alignment relative to established uh, decarbonization trajectories. Alongside the industry initiatives, uh, the reg regulatory uh, process will be a uh, key to success or failure um, to achieve the targets. The IMO authority as a regulator of international shipping will be tested, not only by its capability to um, develop the, uh, the final strategy and pathway to decarbonization, but also by the successful implementation of an enforcement of the IMO 2020 sulfur regulations by its member states. Um, everybody will be watching very carefully how this, this is going to play out. And um, the, both the industry and the IMO and its member states um, have very critical years ahead. Uh, there's a, a common um, opinion that the target or the ambition um, to reduce CO2 emissions per transport work uh, by 40% by uh, relative to the 2008 emissions um, by 2020, that it's achievable with a combination of um, improved energy efficiency of both new and existing vessels, as well as operational measures such as speed limit or power limitation. And limited adoption of alternative fuels such as LNG. However, there are some significant risks um, that need to be considered. The CO2 emissions relative to 2008 have dropped, and this drop has been largely due to the slow steaming in the, um, in the tough uh, market conditions. There have also been energy efficiency improvements, both for existing vessels uh, with, with some um, retrofitting as well as new, new vessels with the EEDI requirements. But some of these gains uh, from 2008 are at risk um, if the market conditions improve. And if the improvement is sustained, um, the benefits of slow steaming uh, could be lost. And then the um, emission re reductions by 2030 will become more challenging. Ideally, if that happens, uh, it should accelerate technology development um, to eventually achieve the 2050 target of reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in total uh, by 50%. However, at the moment, um, there really doesn't seem to be a clear pathway for achieving these goals uh, due to a number of challenges. As I mentioned previously, um, there is no obvious choice of alternative fuel um, or energy storage um, that would be available in the scale and scope um, needed for deep cheap shipping. And also the financial resources needed um, to develop low carbon technology are limited. The current gap um, in the available and required technology is still large, both in scale and scope. And it can be years before these efforts will deliver significant improvements um, in emissions. We can use LNG as, the, as fuel and as an example. It's taken a decade uh, to build the infrastructure to even uh, provide um, the, the small amount of, um, of fuel that is, uh, is provided um, to international shipping. 
So um, in the short term, um, Axon is really needed to maintain the reductions um, already gained and improve from it towards 2030. Operational measures could be implemented fastest, but um, IMO member states have differing interests, so it's not so straightforward. The industry will be keenly watching um, the, <coughs> both the International Working Group um, session um, and MEPC 75 in, in March, April this, this year. So uh, we, in my opinion, we really need a pragmatic approach um, without, of course, sacrificing safety and technical integrity uh, to implement short-term measures as soon as, as possible. The measures could be implemented in stages, allowing time for development a more complex and sophisticated framework that can take advantage of digital and other future developments in the industry. Even, in the, uh, even with the urgency that we have, it is still critical that the process results in good regulations. And we could um, learn from the past. So let's consider how it would be if, um, if, if the ships would not have to carry all the, all the multiple fuel types that they are required to carry today. So if in 2005, if the sulfur limit would have been set globally at 0.5% rather than 3.5%, uh, would we still need the ECAS? And would the transition to uh, a single fuel, possibly with a phased approach, um, have been better than providing the, um, an equivalency option of scrubbers? And this kind of... Um, uh, points to me some of the risks that we have uh, with goal-based approach. Goal-based uh, regulations are intended to provide um, compliance options and incentives for technology development. But they need to be very carefully formulated to get the desired outcome and to avoid necessary, unnecessary complexity and bureaucracy um, in the implementation and enforcement. Let's look at the other major requirement um, that has impacted the industry, um, and that's the double hull requirement for, for oil tankers. At the time when the, these regulations were developed, there were multiple alternatives proposed to prevent um, oil pollution from, from tankers. However, the regulation uh, remained prescriptive, requiring a double hull for all tankers. And the modern tankers have a fairly standard uh, structural um, arrangement uh, with, of course, some minor um, modifications. And maybe the markets could have um, eventually led to a uh, standard configuration anyway, but possibly there could have been a, a period of prototype testing before getting there. So I, I would like to challenge you to consider the role of standardization in the future to eliminate some of the inefficiencies and to lower the cost of building ships. And also maybe to reduce the cost of developing a global infrastructure for multiple fuel alternatives. We should not discourage, of course, innovation or simplify complicated technological issues to come up with a quick prescriptive requirement. I'm not suggesting that. But the complex, I am suggesting that the complex analysis and testing should be done before and during the regulatory process. And the resulting regulation should be clear and feasible to implement and enforce. So this leads me to talk about another regulatory development that we really can't, we have to talk about when we talk about lessons learned, and that's of course the Ballast Water Management Convention. It is an example of a regulation that was not clear. It could not be implemented in its initial form, and the 
compliance and enforcement has been fraught with uncertainty. It is a reminder that regulating technology that doesn't exist is very complicated. And that's what we are facing for when we are starting to regulate technology for low carbon technology. So while the regulatory process focuses mainly on the short term measures, accelerated development of zero carbon fuels and technology is needed. And this cannot wait for regulatory process to complete its course. It has to happen parallel. Global technology collaboration to both review the alternatives and innovate new solutions is, is needed. Ultimately, regulations are needed to provide the foundation for a level playing field. And regulatory certainty is needed to encourage and not penalize the early adopters. We should um, study outside of our industry how others have faced our grand challenges and uh, achieved their, their goals. So examples of this include the uh, Apollo program, which accomplished its mission of uh, getting a man to the moon, and the building and the discoveries from the CERN particle accelerator, which has been truly an international collaboration effort involving thousands of scientists, engineers, and, and technicians. Due to the financial and intellectual resources um, that were required by both the Apollo mission or the CERN discoveries, could, this could not have been achieved by a small group of scientists and engineers alone. In the same way, the stakeholders in the maritime trade and transportation need to accelerate the research and development work with collaboration in a grand scale, um, utilizing both global and public, global, private and public R&D resources. Addressing the grand challenge with an international collaboration does not eliminate the competition and the need for commercial entities to develop their own commercially viable and, and safe solutions. The transition to low carbon shipping will require a large financial investment. I'm sure you've seen in the press recently that um, a recent study um, uh, set the cost to reduce the CO2 emissions by 2050 um, to by 50% um, at $1 trillion. And this was based on a recent study by um, University Maritime Advisory Services, UMass, and the Energy Transition uh, Commission. Most of this spending, according to them, would go to the developments um, of the infrastructure and production facilities to supply alternative fuels. And only 13% of the cost would be actually um, um, on the ships themselves. So these figures, this trillion dollar figure is, is based on an acad academic study um, using uh, various scenarios. Um, and the reality may be somewhat different, but we, we can be sure that the costs will be high. And it is very difficult to see um, the source of this investment uh, without assigning um, a cost to CO2. This will be a, a difficult conversation that uh, all stakeholders will need to have, and this debate has already started. A tariff of $2 per ton of fuel has been proposed by ship owner associations with the proceeds used to fund R&D. As a cost, it would be insignificant, and it could be easily absorbed by the industry, but it would not change behavior. Um, it's not big enough. And it would limit incentive for developing new technology only for those who have access to the fund. However, we can argue that it is a small step in the right direction. Ultimately, the costs 
should be translated to business opportunities and low carbon technology should provide a competitive advantage. With the uh, current uncertainty about the future fuels and technology, shipping companies are reluctant to invest in new ships that may become obsolete uh, before uh, investment has been recovered. The order book is shrinking, which is helping to fix the supply demand imbalance, which is a good thing. At the same time though, reducing shipbuilding demand is financially challenging for the shipyards as well as for the um, engine and equipment manufacturers. And these are, um, are organizations that are also expected to develop low carbon technology. Energy companies, of course, have a big part uh, in the transition to alternative fuels. And they also need an, a, a financial intense incentive to accelerate the development. This would require a cost for carbon that really would make investments in low carbon fuels and technology good business, not just a regula regulatory requirement. So if we consider the fast pace of technology development today, things are changing very quickly. We, we should remain optimistic that technical solutions will be available to provide both environmental and financial sustainability for shipping. As soon as the regulatory certainty and financial incentives are in place. At the same time, the, the challenge is grand. It requires uh, bright scientists and engineers, a lot of investment, <laughs> and a lot of hard work. So I was thinking, how would um, the technical community, um, such as Rina, um, contribute to the transition to low carbon shipping? Now, RENA is already supporting the regulatory development in um, IMO by providing technical input, and that's very valuable. Uh, new regulations um, and new technology often have unintended consequences and sometimes safety risks. It is um, really critical that the alternative fuel and new technology development has uh, priority on safety and that the regulations cover that aspect well. It is also important that the, re the regulations have a solid technical basis. So I was thinking what else could the, uh, the technical community do? Um, and um, communication of uh, complex technical issues in a language that is understood by regulators can be very challenging. And the challenge is even bigger when communicating to the general public. It's interesting that the, the um, general media has recently um, increased their coverage of shipping and really focusing on emissions. Unfortunately, they often confuse issues in their articles. For example, CO2 and sulfur emissions and their impact on the environment is often confused and, and uh, um, mixed. So I'm suggesting that communication uh, that would increase understanding of technical, technical issues by the society at large could be an opportunity for the technical community to increase its impact uh, during these critical transition years for the industry. It will be an exciting decade and I'm uh, very much looking forward to your contributions on LNG, LPG, and alternative fuel ships.